Hi, I'm Nora O'Donnell, and this is Person to Person. Our guest today is the secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch. Lonnie Bunch is a historian and curator by training, and he now runs the world's largest museum and education system, visited by millions every year. As secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, he oversees 21 museums, including the two in development and a zoo, plus thousands of employees. Have a good one, y'all. Give me some five. Bunch was named one of the 100 most influential museum professionals of the 20th century. He's most known for bringing to life the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Nearly a dozen Smithsonians are located on the National Mall, where there are all kinds of celebrations, including fireworks to celebrate America's independence. Lonnie Bunch joins us from the nation's capital for a person-to-person -person conversation. Lonnie Bunch, so good to see you. How are you? I am spectacular. I hope you are well as too. Yes, thank you so much. You are one of the smartest people I know. Um, you get to witness and curate so much history as we've just celebrated the 4th of July. What should we be reminded of? The 4th of July is this really interesting holiday that on the one hand, it's this opportunity to celebrate American independence. On the other hand, it's also a holiday that many people always felt that as we celebrate, some of us were left out of the celebration, that there's always been this interesting paradox, that on the one hand, you celebrate freedom, you celebrate the founding fathers, and on the other hand, you're leaving out many. And so for some, the 4th of July became a place to protest as well as a place to celebrate. What is it that many are missing? Because I think people now think of July 4th as fireworks and cookouts, but our history is so rich with lessons that we should also be marking. First of all, the 4th of July should remind us to come together as a nation. It should remind us of the struggle to actually define America and to become a nation, to find our freedom from, the, from Great Britain. But it also should challenge us to live up to the ideals of the founders, the notion that this is a place of freedom and equality and liberty should be accessible for all. And I think the challenge for the 4th of July has always been people believing, but if we're not having access to that freedom, should we believe in the 4th of July? On that note, let's read now from the document that starts in Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. As a nation, we haven't always lived up to that promise. One of the powerful things about the Declaration of Independence is that it's aspirational and that there have been a variety of groups, people of color, women, who realize that they haven't been given the, the rights of others, but because of the aspirational nation of that document, people say, we are just helping America live up to its stated ideals. So I think the notion of that the United States has always been a work in progress and that the declaration is really an ideal and that it allows us to challenge, to push, to vote, to protest, to do what we can to help the country live up to those stated ideals. And that is really, I think, both the paradox, that it is really an ideal document of who we think we are, but it's also an aspirational document of who we can be if we are pushed and challenged in the right way. Lonnie, we've just had a series of divisive Supreme Court rulings, witnessing these investigative hearings on uh, Capitol Hill about the assault that happened on January 6th many feeling hopeless that our country is so divided. What does history tell us about the struggles our country has been through and how we've gotten through it? Well, in many ways, this is a moment, but it's a moment like other moments. It's a moment where we've been divided around the Civil War, we were divided around civil rights, we've been divided around women's issues. And I think that what history tells us is that as difficult as this moment is, that we need to recognize that as a nation, we've come through comparable moments. I think that history really helps us by defining reality, but still giving hope. Mm -hmm. So as dark as the time is, I think about 
my ancestors being enslaved, and now I'm the secretary of the Smithsonian. So these things give me hope. And I think that's what I want America to realize is that these are difficult times. These are challenges. I think we need to try to live up to our stated ideals. But I believe strongly that the nation will continue to perfect itself as we move forward. I love how you describe Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, as a living embodiment of a contradiction. Explain that. In some ways, Thomas Jefferson's great language about freedom and the importance of freedom is really so clear because he knew as an owner of people what the lack of freedom meant. As a slave owner, he knew what it meant not to have rights, not to control your family, not to control your hopes and aspirations. So in many ways, he was able to write so powerfully about freedom because he knew what the lack of freedom was. And in, in some ways, that's the paradox of Jefferson. That's the paradox of the founding fathers. The notion that it means that this is a time when you set an ideal, but you realize that most Americans didn't have access to that ideal. If you look at women and African Americans. So I think that the challenge for, for us is to recognize that we have to learn to live with that paradox. We have to learn to celebrate the brilliance that was Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, but also recognize that that's a flawed document as well. And that what you see since then has been an attempt by people to help the country live up to those ideals. And that's the power of it, that it's an aspirational document. How do you celebrate 4th of July? For many people, what the 4th of July has become is besides a day to celebrate independence, it's a day to celebrate family. Yeah. And so that's what I do. I love the notion. I have the earliest memories of going in the backyard with my mom and dad and all kinds of relatives, um, probably cooking food we shouldn't have eaten. Um, but the notion of family coming together and telling stories. And in some ways, that's part of what made me a person to work in museums. I used to love to go to those barbecues and hear Uncle Joe say something and then Aunt Mary would take it in a different way. So I've always said a good exhibition is like a backyard barbecue. Um, ah. It is something that brings people together. It's something that celebrates and it's something that goes in a direction you couldn't imagine because people bring their own interests to the subject. That's a terrific way to look at it. And speaking of that as a curator, you put together the American History Museum's exhibit, The American Presidency, A Glorious Burden. What is the president's role on July 4th? Well, I think that what is clear to me is that if you look at the history of the American presidency, what you'll see is that at the time of their election, these were the most popular until this moment men, um, but that they also recognize that they had many challenges that are common. Challenges of how do you in fairness for people of color, for women. So what you see is that for me, celebrating the 4th of July is drawing from those amazing presidents, some who were really effective, some less so. But ultimately what it tells me is that the nation is still a work in progress. And that in some ways you often get the president, not necessarily you need, but the president you deserve. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's so interesting to me is recognizing that the 4th of July should really always challenge us to make sure our leaders um, fulfill our highest expectations. What do you hear from people when they visit the Smithsonian Museums? Since the pandemic, what you're really seeing is thousands of people coming back. The numbers are great. And what they're doing is there's a sense of looking for connectivity. Um, that even though we Zoomed and we talked, the reality is being together, being able to engage, to convert, to talk to each other has been very, very powerful. And so what I'm hearing are people saying, let me come to the Smithsonian because the Smithsonian in some ways is the glue that holds a nation together. Here's where you can find our common history. Here's where you can find our common understanding of science. And so I think that what I'm seeing are people desperate to try to come together to find things that allow them to believe in the strengths of the country and the resiliency of the country. So well said. And when we come back, we'll talk to Lonnie Bunch about the two museums currently in development at the Smithsonian. So, Lonnie, you already oversee 21 museums, is that right? 
There are 19 now and two on the way. And two on the way. Tell us about these new two. When I was fortunate to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture, I figured that's it. I'm not building anything else. Um, but now as secretary, we have an opportunity to craft two new museums, um, a National Museum of the American Latino and a Smithsonian American Women's History Museum. And what's so powerful about it is that part of what is wonderful about the Smithsonian is that we give people different portals into what it means to be an American. They can come through the African-American Museum or the Air and Space Museum. And so what these museums will do, these new museums, will help us illuminate even more both the strength and the challenges of being American. So it's an extremely exciting time. But as my youngest daughter said, so wait a minute, Dad, it took you 11 years to build one. Now you got to build two. <laughs> So that's the challenge of the Smithsonian. <laughs> What's the timeline for these new museums? Well, I think that what you want to do is recognize that building museums, you know, on or near the mall, it's really a 10 year endeavor, right? By the time you raise funds, get congressional support, plan the structures, work on the exhibitions, build the collections. But what I think we also want to do is recognize that history can't wait. So we want to birth these museums digitally. We want to use them as a way to convey the story of women or of the Latino experience so that people can um, get it from their schools and in their homes. Lonnie, you just gave me the goosebumps. That's awesome. Like, that's just so interesting and smart. And I'm glad we are sort of democratizing, if many ways, or spreading the work of the Smithsonian digitally, because not everybody can make it to Washington, D.C., or many students, as you know, may just get the one high school field trip, you know what I mean, to Washington, D.C. Let's talk about that National Museum of the American Latino. What do you hope to accomplish? Well, I think that partly what you want to do is make these museums as a kind of two-sided coin. On the one hand, you want to introduce the public to this amazing history. There is culture that we don't understand. Um, there are stories, there are heroes that we need to make sure are risen up. Um, but on the other hand, you want to make sure that the museums craft their story so that people see that the story of the American Latino is a quintessential American story. It's a story that has shaped us all and that we're all made better by engaging it. So the key is that we are not really trying to create museums that create separate but equal stories, but rather we're saying here is another way to understand who we are and that we're better as a nation if we understand the totality of who we are. And these museums will help us do just that. And I've seen some of the trustees already for that museum, Jose Andres, Eva Longoria, Sofia Vergara. I mean, everybody's helping you out, Lonnie. <laughs> no, I need all the help I can get. I'm just a poor historian. And so I think that what is exciting is that much like when building the African American Museum, people realize how rare an opportunity it is to build a national museum, to build something that's part of the Smithsonian that really will um, change America and exist as long as there is an America. So there's great excitement for both of these museums. And we're very honored because there's no way we could do this without the kind of engagement and excitement of the general public and of people whose names are better well known. I remember when Gail King and I came to visit you at the African American Museum when it first opened, that beautiful museum, that crown that sits on the National Mall, and what you have curated, the historical artifacts and stories, including the lunch counters, Rosa Parks' dress. I mean, just to get all those materials is so much work. It's so rich with history. People are so moved by it, Lonnie. You did such, and your whole team did such an amazing job. Well, thank you. I mean, I think you're right. It was a whole team. And the notion of saying, first of all, how do we tell stories? Um, you know, this is one of the things that I used to spend time with Oprah Winfrey talking about. And she said, you know, the key to success is good storytelling. So I wanted to make sure we told good stories and that we reduced history to human scale. You know, the challenge is if you talk about slavery or migration, sometimes people, you know, graze through it. But if you can re reduce the human scale, then you care. Then you see your own experiences, your own family. And so I think that's part of it. And I, and I, what I loved about building that museum and building these other museums is that the public said to us, 
we trust the Smithsonian. We trust you with our artifacts. We trust you with our stories. And I always told people that work for me that you're not building a museum. What you're doing is putting people's culture in your hands. Mm. So treat it with respect and love. And I think in a way that helped us build a museum that mattered for all Americans. Well, you can tell it was made with love and great respect. Um, let's talk about the American Women's History Museum. Hello. I'm excited for that one. <laughs> Lonnie, last time I checked, we're half of the population. <laughs> and, and last time I checked, my whole life has been shaped by women, so I want to make sure we get this right. <laughs> I know. Well, so incredibly important, important. Um, and so much of our nation's history um, has been shaped by women. Um, and yet women, I think, like many people, too, in our history, feel like they haven't had the proper recognition for their contributions. What will this museum do? Well, I think that's right. I think that in some ways, traditionally, we've looked at power as holding office, um, being in the military. Um, but so much of the power that has shaped the nation has been through the way women have navigated this system, um, whether it's the kind of political leadership that we can point to, whether it's Susan B. Anthony or Bella Abzuk or, um, or Barbara Jordan, but it's also the notion of how the daily lives of women shape this nation um, beyond raising family, shaping political issues. And so what I think is powerful is that this is a needed corrective. It's crucially important to let people understand how central women are to the shaping of this nation but also how in many ways their struggle for equality, for fairness, for the vote um, has really enhanced fairness for everyone else. So that in essence, it's a story that says we're made better as we understand how women struggled for the right to vote, our women struggled for the right to own property, um, to be equal, because that equality isn't a zero sum game. It's in essence, we're all made better as more people are equal. So I'm very excited that this museum will finally allow us to really focus on, as you said, a segment of the population that is large, that is significant, that is important, that has often been undervalued. Mm -hmm. We learn from people, my daughter loves Harriet Tubman, you know, learning about her just as a six-year-old, you know, from yeah. me, Ida B. Wells, you know, um, great journalists, women who have been writing about corruption um, for exactly. centuries. I mean, there are, these are the kind of stories that once you discover that these women existed through history, you say, wow, I want to be somebody yeah. like that. I can have power like someone like that to change things, to change the course of history. I, I think you've put your finger on what is really important for this museum, and that is you want to create a platform where people think that these things are possible for themselves um, so that they can recognize that they're part of a long tradition of people struggling to become journalists that have transformed the way we understood corporations in the early 20th century or Ida B. Wells saying that I will shine light on lynching so that we can begin to fight against that. Um, and so I think that in many ways, the great joy of the Smithsonian is every day we discover something new. We discover new stories, new history. And so this museum will allow us to sort of bring that story to Washington. But the best part of it is that these new museums will be beacons that, yes, will draw people to Washington. But then we want to push them back to local museums, mm -hmm. to other museums that are exploring women's history in local communities. And so I think the power of this is that the Smithsonian is like um, a rock in a pond. It creates a ripple that then helps other museums, other communities tell their story. And that's the great strength of the Smithsonian. Lonnie Bunch is staying with us. And when we come back, we're going to ask him about some of his favorite artifacts in the Smithsonian Museum collection. Okay, Lonnie Bunch, you've seen so many artifacts as, as curating, help curating all of these Smithsonian 21 museums. Do you have a favorite? 
Oh my goodness, there are 155 million objects in the Smithsonian collections. So I have a few. Uh, for me, what was so moving is when I came back to be a curator back in the 80s, I was a curator of political history and I was trying to learn the collections. So one day I opened a drawer and I pulled out a box. And it was a little sort of four inch square box and I opened it and it turned out to be a compass. And we weren't sure what it was. We looked it up and then suddenly I realized it's the compass that Lewis and Clark carried when they went across the country oh in the early 19th century. <laughs> so I thought the key to being a good curator is don't drop anything, right? <laughs> and so, uh, so that has always been one of my favorite memories of sort of the wonders of the Smithsonian. Um, but I also love, to be honest, there is one of the things that moved me so much when I first came to the Smithsonian in the 70s was a moon rock. You know, there was an opportunity for people to go into the Air and Space Museum and touch a moon rock. And I just remember thinking, how amazing this place, the Smithsonian is, that it lets you do things that you could never imagine. It brings things into your life that you may only think about, but suddenly now to see it and be able to touch a moon rock, to me, it just made me feel that, boy, this Smithsonian is this place that can make America better, that can inspire, that can educate. I thought, what a wonderful place to work. Yeah. Well, you're such an inspiration to so many people. What do you think Doc Bunch, your grandfather, the dentist, would think about Lonnie Bunch III being the first African-American Smithsonian secretary? You know, I get emotional um, because I think of my grandfather, um, Lonnie the First, basically, who change a family's trajectory by going to college, by demanding that he was not going to be a sharecropper. And I would hope that everything I've done has, would make him smile, would make him realize that what he did was create a platform of possibility for my dad and for me. And that in essence, all I ever try to do as a historian is use history to bring people together to help them understand the challenges we face, to help them cross racial lines. And I think the doc, who was this amazingly, as my memory of a four-year-old is, but amazingly gregarious person who brought people together in the house, I always think that all I'm trying to do is help bring America together, like he brought our family together. Well, you are doing that through all your work, and we need more history to bring this country together. So thank you. Thanks to your entire team. Lonnie Bunch, thank you for joining us on Person to Person. It's my pleasure always to be with you. Always great.